les, tous les paramètres propulsifs sont normaux et la trajectoire est normale. the session with that particular video because it ties in really nicely with our topic today which is going to look at well if we can create fantastic software why doesn't it work all the time and the world is littered with examples of good intentions but poor testing which ends up causing faults which lead to things like spectacular crashes like the one you just saw now lucky for this particular flight, there was no loss in life. It was just taking a payload of expensive technology to space, but it did cost billions of dollars, and all of that was lost. Our focus today is to show understanding of ways of exposing and avoiding faults in programs before they are released to the public. We're going to be looking at locating and identifying different types of errors, and most of these you might be familiar with especially things like syntax errors. And then there are others like logic errors and runtime errors, which can be very difficult to spot. You need to release the program out in the wild to test it and then fix those particular bugs. So learning about how to correct these identified errors is also part of the process. So hopefully we're going to be looking at all of that today. And as usual, let's start by looking at the key terms. So do pause the video and jot these ones down. These will be useful for definition type questions. And I think most of these are going to be pretty familiar, but try to make sure that you use the right words, the right technical words to describe them. So syntax errors, we know errors in grammars, the most common ones, logic errors, often given incorrect results, and runtime errors are only found when you actually execute the program or run it. All of that is tested using a test plan, and often at IGCSE level, we use a method called trace tables or dry running to check an algorithm before we started coding it. So trace tables basically are the process of dry running a program where you have columns which show the values of variables as you go through a particular algorithm. And that's used quite extensively before you actually start coding. So pause the video, jot these down, and then let's look at this video, which shows that even the best in the world can often struggle. Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. <laughs> Moving must, right must, along. That must be... Uh... That must be why we're not shipping Windows 98 Absolutely. Yet. <laughs> Absolutely. So as you can see, even the great Bill Gates struggled with live demonstrations and tech faults. And most of this can happen due to silly things, an exception that hasn't been captured. In this case, what happened was that the operating system wanted to write to a file which did not exist. And that should have been captured by an exception somewhere. But that resulted in the blue screen of death and you know, quite a big embarrassment for Microsoft. So one little line of code can often end up costing hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's essential for programmers to get into the habit of testing their code and checking things and planning ahead. But as you know, what happens is that we love to just simply go onto a computer and start coding. There's not a lot of thought given into design and planning of tests, let alone design and planning of algorithms. And that obviously leads to massive failure. Now these failures can be quite expensive or quite embarrassing or quite serious because it can lead to loss of life. So on screen you see a few examples which were caused by poor testing. PayPal accidentally credited a man 92 quadrillion dollars. Luckily they found out before the man even opened their account and uh, they fixed the problem. There was a bug in the Windows calculator program for quite some time and quite a few operating systems where it, you know if you tried to work out I think the square root of four and then added two and a few number it generated some floating point 
uh, operation errors and it was just recently fixed in Windows 10. So, you know, we're talking about decades before this bug was actually fixed. Then there's things like the Gangnam Style music video which broke the YouTube view counter. Because in the early days of YouTube, nobody actually thought that people would be watching a video more than two or three billion times. And they decided to use 32-bit integer to store the data. And obviously, you know that once um, you exceed that number that can be stored in a 32-bit uh, integer, it causes an overflow error. So quite a lot of things like the Y2K bug in the year 2000 where dates were stored in four bits when you went to 2000 the system couldn't cope and similarly there's the year 2038 problem where dates in certain systems are stored in 32-bit integers and that particular date won't be able to fit in now you thought people would have learned from it uh, however luckily for us we have now moved on to 64-bit code and 64-bit system so it's highly unlikely that 32-bit systems are going to be there. However, if you're going to be using dates in 64-bit formats at some particular time, we'll hit that limit as well. Now, there was a bug in the Pentium processor, which was quite expensive at the time, but it had a few issues in calculating floating point operations successfully, and it, that wasn't picked up, and that led to quite a few issues when that processor came about and it had to be recalled. And then there's the big, big things like the Mars Orbiter, which ended up crashing because somebody forgot to convert metric systems to imperial systems or, and vice versa. So one part of the code was dealing with imperial systems, you know, inches and those kind of things, miles. The other was looking at the metric and that conversion was missing and that caused a crash. And then there was the Patriot missile failure which led to loss of life in the Gulf War. You, you can search for a huge amount of these failures and then there are systems like IT systems in the police for hospitals where somebody thinks that it's a clever idea to create a database that can work across all hospitals or all police stations but doesn't realize that there are different formats of data that, that are being stored in different police stations, different experiences and all of that eventually leads to very expensive failures of IT systems. So we need to think about all of the things and all of this will we'll look in due course when we start looking at testing plans and strategies and white box and black box testing and alpha and beta testing and all of that later. But it starts with you and syntax testing while you're coding. So are you checking the syntax? That's easily detected. Are you checking the logic? Are you trying to look at all possible outcomes? And you might not be able to cover all possible outcomes, but if you cover enough outcomes, then chances are you're gonna end up with a robust program and not a failed program. So let's look back at that rocket launch and work out how an integer overflow can lead to such a serious crash. So. What was the ultimate cause of this incredibly expensive, very short and ultimately catastrophic rocket flight? A simple line of code, converting a floating point to an integer that led to an overflow, passed without warning to the main computer, which was interpreted as real, if wildly inaccurate, data. Want to know the worst bit? That buggy bit of code wasn't even necessary during flight. It was part of the launch pad alignment process and shouldn't have been running after liftoff. But sometimes a small glitch somewhere causes a launch to be delayed by a few seconds. So to save having to reset the system, the original programmers decided to keep that bit of code running for 40 seconds after the scheduled liftoff time. A multitude of failures that led to that particular crash. Now the problem with faults is that they can occur anywhere, in any system. There are stories in the news about banks finding that its customers are locked out of their accounts for quite a while, especially when they're doing a software update. So nowadays you'll probably see that banks will tell customers in advance that they're going to run an update and systems and services might not be available between 
7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Saturday or Sunday or something like that, or, or 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. most likely they try to run it when people are least likely to use their services. And there are instances where airlines end up canceling flights because there are programming errors. Uh, in fact, there was a prison service that had been releasing prisoners many days earlier than required for about 15 years before that particular bug, that faulty program was discovered. And faults in an executable program are frequently faults in the design of the program. The designer, the programmer, has left something unattended which is causing these issues. And you might be the best company in the world, the best programmer in the world. You might not even be making a program itself, and it could be an actual product. Often, bugs creep in, and there's nothing you can do about it. So let's just watch this video to see what I mean. Sure? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, maybe that was a little too hard. <laughs> Should we try the <laughs> So even the great Elon Musk and his Tesla armored truck failed on stage. But moving back to something closer to home, to coding itself, Locating errors, identifying it, and correcting errors is a common process that programmers need to do. And we start off by looking at the first type of error, which is syntax errors. And these are errors in the grammar of a source program. And you've encountered these countless times. You miss a bracket, you miss a semicolon, you spell print as pint or something random like that, and that leads to a crash. So the syntax of the program is often checked and nowadays IDEs, integrated development environments where you're coding, are clever enough to suggest how to correct these errors and they point those out by underlining it or giving you an error message when you try to run the program and then you can go back and fix it. So see if you can spot the error in this particular program that I've wrote up. Now hopefully that was an easy one. And these type of errors are detected during the compilation and interpretation stages of the program. So while you're coding, these errors are detected, fixed, because the program isn't allowed to continue. So they're very easy to fix and identify. Now, logic errors are errors in the logic of a program, meaning the program doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. And these errors are usually found when the program is being tested. So you've coded it, and you're trying to test the program, and then you find, oh, oh it's not doing what it's supposed to. So in this particular case, you've got a program which is supposed to be navigating north, south, east, and west. And if you know a grid system, you know that if you want to go north, you've got to go up on the y-axis. And if you want to go east, you've got to go on the x-axis. So the problem is that in the north stage, we are moving on the x-direction. So when I press the north button or end button, instead of going north, it goes towards the east. So the logic is incorrect. And how do you detect these? Well, most IDEs offer a technique called stepping, where you execute one line of code at a time and check the results, so that can help. But more, more than often, it's a trace table. You need to manually check your algorithm to make sure that it's working properly, all the variables are being recorded, and you use a process called dry running. So we're manually checking this, and you have a lot of experience at IDCSE in going through a flowchart or a bit of pseudocode and creating a trace table. And that's exactly what you're doing in a dry run. So the final set of errors that we deal with while developing a program are called runtime errors. And these happen when the program is executed. The program may stop unexpectedly or go into an infinite loop, or you might need to stop it by brute force. And that normally happens when you've written the code and you're just testing the code out. So in an IDE, this type of an error can be managed, but if you created an executable file, it becomes a lot more tricky because you might have given it to a user already. So an example that you see on screen is a short program where you take two numbers, the user will need to type these numbers, and you simply print out the result of the division. So nothing's wrong with that. The program works when I'm testing it out, but when I give it to somebody to use, they might do a division by zero. So the first number is 10, the second is zero. The end result is that the program crashes out. 
So a suitable error message should have been generated, an exception or validation should have been put into place here to fix these type of problems. However, if this was already released, then what needed to be done would be that I fix a problem and then I release an update. Or I could create a small patch, which is basically a small program, and that program would then need to be applied to the software that you released, and it will patch that bug when fix those problems. So the difference between a patch and an update is an update is the existing program re-released with the fixed code, and the patch is basically a small program, which is the fixed code, and that basically is patched over the original software. Now, Windows, as you might know, is patched quite frequently, and the process is all, almost automatic. You download an update without the user ever knowing that was happening. So now you've got a task. You are aware of syntax, logic, and runtime errors and how they are. I want you to create a table like this one in your exercise book, and I want you to record four of each type, so a total of 12 examples of the errors you might have encountered whilst programming. If you haven't encountered some of these errors or you don't realize or you can't remember them, then perhaps do some research online and create suitable examples and possible fixes. An example is given to you on screen where there's an error where the name variable is assigned an input, but there is a syntax error with that due to you know the programmer missing a bracket at the end. So the fix basically is add a bracket at the end of that. So you could create syntax errors like this pretty much easily, but I want you to also think about logic and runtime errors, which could be possible. So seek out these examples if you don't know them and then complete this table. Hopefully that was a great opportunity for you to get some examples and learn about fixing these types of errors. By now, you should know what a logic error is and how it can be fixed. Similarly, what a runtime error is and how you can go about fixing it and how syntax errors can be fixed within an IDE. You should also know what is meant by dry running a program and what the difference is between a patch and an update. As usual, if there's anything you're not sure of, just pop a message to me and I will see you in the next lesson.